Welcome, Justin Rayok. Hello. Is my mic on? Yeah, it is. Great. We got slides. Aha, thank you. Great to see all of you in person. This is actually my uh, fourth conference in about as many weeks, so we went like months with nothing. I was at uh, DevOps Days Aarhus in Denmark last week, uh, DevOps Days Birmingham, Alabama in the US before that, DevNexus in Atlanta. I know some of you were at DevNexus as well. Really, really great to be back on the road being able to talk to so many people about developer productivity engineering. Uh, my name's Justin Riach. Uh, my background is in software development. I wrote code for a long portion of my career, moved into enterprise architecture, and then really doing a lot of SI work systems integration with uh, open source solutions. Uh, and to me, open source is always about productivity, right? I mean, I think everybody knows the free is in free speech versus free beer. Some people like to say free puppies, which I think is a little bit more realistic there. But at the end of the day, having access to that software immediately uh, through publicly accessible channels that's freely redistributable absolutely accelerates developer productivity. So not a huge transition to go from that to start talking about what we're going to talk about today. OK. So it all kind of starts here. All right, they look, they look pretty happy, don't they? Of course they do. They're learning how to program, right? A lot of us have been there. A lot of us have felt that joy. Probably type to system.out.println, hello world, hit enter, showed up on the screen, it worked. Victorious dopamine, creative flow, right? That's what it means to be in a good state of programming. But imagine if these kids were waiting 45 seconds, a minute, an hour, 10 hours for that feedback to actually come back to them, right? That's not flow. That's toil, that's frustration. That's not happiness, right? That's stress, all right? So we're gonna talk about that today. We're gonna talk a lot about how software development is fundamentally both a creative and scientific process, right? There's creative problem solving, and then there's asking a hypothesis to the build tool chain. Did, does this solution do what I want it to do, right? Is this gonna make the computer uh, do what I need it to do? Right? And then the brain has been mapped in these states before. A lot of right brain and left brain activity going on. Lots of neurochemistry happening. Serotonin, dopamine, adrenaline, right? But it all comes back to flow. And this is not just about hello world anymore. Some of you may have seen this statistic. Uh, this was uh, predicted back in October of 2020 uh, by IDC that by now, 2022, roughly two-thirds of the global GDP will be digitally transformed. Two-thirds. Now, COVID absolutely accelerated that, those transformation efforts a little bit, but, but this is where we are. We now have a single workforce that is in some way responsible for two-thirds of the global GDP. Okay? Uh, a couple of months ago, this report was published. The research was actually done more like six months ago. Some of you may have heard that we mapped the remaining 8% of the human genome. It happened this year. It happened uh, as a result of a number of things, including advancements in deep neural network software uh, and collaboration over Slack. And scientists were actually working over Slack, map mapping the rest of this genome. Okay, software. Software advancements have helped to lift other boats in the harbor, arguably all boats in the harbor. And the best code, is written by happy developers. So we really should strive to foster developer joy at this point, because software is lifting up all industries and solving some of the biggest problems that have been faced by our society. But unfortunately, that's not happening. <laughs> Enterprise software development is instead creating a whole unique set of challenges for modern developers. Ironically, as the solution becomes more successful as more developers begin working on it, contributing more code, the number of dependencies increase, the number of tests that we have to write also increase. The feedback cycle times for developers, the developer experience suffers. Right? The better that the software is doing from an adoption, success, uh, sophistication standpoint, the harder the time developers have 
in just the developer experience of, of writing these apps. And I think a lot of you are probably familiar with this quote, especially if you've been around DevOps within the last few years. This has sort of become the rallying cry for DevOps. And it's no longer the big beating the small, but the fast beating the slow. You may have seen other derivatives of this quote. Sometimes it says eating. That's not the Eric Pearson version, though. But what does this quote really mean? It means it's not about the massive corporations anymore that are really uh, guiding human experience and, and dominating the industry. It's about the small, fast, reactive companies, the ones who can bring their software features to market the fastest, right? the ones who are able to go from code and ideation to monetization in a really fast amount of time. Right? But despite this knowledge, this is what a lot of our calendars look like right now. So we start out the day, we're fresh, we're ready, we're coding, we're in flow, we're happy. And then we're waiting for our local build to complete. OK, and then it fails. Now we're spending the rest of that morning troubleshooting a, a broken build. So then we go to lunch, come back, we're refreshed, we had lunch, we fixed our local build, we're back to coding again, things are great, local build works awesome, pass it down to CI, tests are flaky. Spend the rest of the day debugging flaky tests. Now, this isn't just uh, some idea we came up with, right? We actually polled people. Uh, we wanted to know for folks who had started to really adopt developer productivity engineering principles, you know, what were the pain points that they were feeling that, that brought them to this practice, right? What was going wrong? Overwhelmingly, 92% of the respondents saying that it's too much time waiting on local build and test uh, cycles to complete. And then shortly thereafter is just the inability, uh, inability to easily troubleshoot and determine the root cause of build test CI failures, including flaky tests. It's 2022. And 92% uh, of developers are just saying, hey, it takes too long to get my feedback that I need from the computer. I can't stay in a state of flow. I'm having to context switch too often. Now, productivity management is not new, right? Uh, anybody familiar with the goal, the theory of constraints, the Phoenix project some of you may have read, right? Um, this is, I like to say, sometimes the ancient business wisdom of the 70s and 80s in action, right? Now, it was applied to manufacturing back then. But we learned things like systems that can increase throughput and decrease cost will generally win, okay? So a lot of these principles have made their way into very familiar practices now, like change management, agile, lean, Six Sigma, DevOps, ultimately. But DevOps has not widened its scope left enough to include developer experience. There are still major areas in the developer experience that have not been addressed by DevOps. For instance, how many of you right now are actually tracking local build times for developers running on their workstations. A uh, few people see a couple of hands going up. Well, that's a, a pretty basic metric for developer experience, isn't it? I mean, just knowing how long our, our developers are actually waiting on average for de de uh, builds to complete. But, but no one's tracking that. You're not alone, <laughs> right? It's, it's, I, I ask this question a lot. I asked it four times over the last four weeks. I got pretty much the same response. Yeah, people aren't even looking at these metrics. But why, right? Developer experience is so important, right? Developer experience, those feedback cycles, collectively, that's what's driving 65% global GDP digital transformation. And we're not even looking at the basic metrics. So that's why we say that developer productivity engineering is the next big thing in software development. All right, it's not really about, oh, OK, we've become DevOps mature, and now we should start thinking about developer experience. It's really more about how the consciousness of the industry has shifted. All right, even some of the biggest Silicon Valley companies only started putting together productivity teams in the last five years. All right, Netflix famously put theirs together in 2017, uh, LinkedIn pretty shortly thereafter. Right, so the next big thing, the next big consciousness in the industry is what can we do to improve the developer experience? And this is where developer productivity engineering comes in. Now, for all of that kind of theory, it's actually pretty pragmatic, right? Some of you may be familiar with the term pragmatic idealism, 
I really like that term. It was coined, I think, by the Free Software Foundation. It may have been before that. But the idea is basically, I have an ideal. The Free Software Foundation's ideal was free software for the world. But then I need a pragmatism. How can I make that happen? Right? In the case of the Free Software Foundation, that's the GPL. Militantly protecting free software. Making sure that free software stays free. That's the pragmatism to the ideal behind free software for everybody. So our ideal is to give our developers the fastest, most consistent, and most reliable developer experience possible. Right? That's our, that's our uh, ideal. We want to shift the question. The question should not be, is the, the build tool chain fast enough? Are the build cycle times fast enough for developers? We have to get out of that mindset. We have to start asking the proper question. Is that tool chain as fast as it can possibly be, given all acceleration technologies, analytics, and observation? Because that's what we owe our developers. And that's exactly what developer productivity engineering does. The pragmatism is that we take an, uh, uh, we take an engineering approach to the tool chain. It's slow, speed it up. Use technologies to speed it up. You don't have observation, you're not actually sure what your developers are experiencing it, start recording it. Put it on a dashboard, right? That's the essence of developer productivity engineering. Now, we also like to call out that uh, developer productivity engineering is not what you might consider to be more traditional means of developer productivity management, right? So really focusing on, on behavior, and things like that, Th those are important. I mean, there, there, there are great practices out there, but that's not what developer productivity engineering does. We focus on the technology. We focus on the tool chain, right? We're interested in outcomes. We want to see if developer teams are able to increase their velocity as a result of putting these acceleration technologies in place. And so the SDL focus really is right now sort of on the CI and the developer experience part of this. Is this likely to change? Definitely. Right? As developers start doing awesome things like you know, canary releases and doing fun stuff with service mesh and all that, sure, feedback from production will become you know, part of this. Uh, but for now, really, the focus is kind of on CI. Uh, you can feel the benefits of uh, putting these practices in place at every level in the organization. So if you are a developer, if you're an engineer, but you need to sell this to your boss, it's very easy to tie this stuff to decrease time to market, increase productivity, and ultimately better quality of service. And I'm going to show you exactly the relationship between shorter feedback cycles and higher quality. And then, of course, this bubbles up all the way to the top of the organization, revenue, cost, brand, all of these things. But all impacted by putting these practices in place and, again, improving the experience for your developers. So what problem are we actually trying to solve? This picture kind of tells it all. If you could imagine that uh, this is our developer, and these are representative of various feedback cycles that that developer is uh, relying on to understand how well they're doing their work. Sometimes things are fine. Yeah, we're, we're doing fine. Sometimes they just take too long. All right, we talked about that, longer build times. We're going to define what a long build time is. We kind of already did. Is it as fast as it can possibly be? No, then it's slow. Um, it takes too long to fix, all right? I don't have good tools. I don't have good troubleshooting tools. I'm sitting here copying and pasting stuff from 15 different areas of the system and putting it into Slack, playing 20 questions for the first 30 minutes of trying to figure out what went wrong with my build. And then this one, the bane of my existence, this one right here, the problem that could have been avoided altogether. If someone was proactively looking at the friction and the bottlenecks that developers are experiencing, the common failures they're running into, the flaky tests that they're dealing with, then that problem could have been avoided altogether. That toil and friction could have been avoided. All right. Uh, developer productivity engineering fosters developer joy. The same study, 81% of respondents came back and agreed that uh, developer productivity engineering's impact on their job made their job more enjoyable. All right, so how do we do this? What are the actual solutions? Well, again, I mentioned that it's all pretty pragmatic, right? We have some distinct uh, or even acute pains that are being felt uh, by organizations or individuals, all the way over to more chronic issues that are being felt. And developer productivity engineering wants to address all of them. So we already talked about idle and wait time. 
probably the most acute uh, uh, problem that we want to deal with. So there's actually three technologies that we recommend putting in place that exist right now to speed up this part of the process. We have build caching, which we'll get into, uh, predictive test selection, which uses machine learning, we'll talk about that as well, and then ultimately test distribution. So we'll, 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 we'll get into what all these three technologies are. I don't want to, this slide can be a little bit of a quagmire. <laughs> Next one was the uh, inefficient troubleshooting, right? Uh, for the Java world, we have the build scan. This was brought to the Java world by Gradle, um, uh, who I work for, <laughs> uh, several years ago, and uh, now also works for Maven builds, works for Bazel builds. It's part of the open source tooling. The build scan, if you haven't run one before, is like an MRI of your entire build. All those things that I mentioned before that you're usually chasing around, trying to find, it's all already there for you in one place, self-service, post-build. Software builds, you get a link, you get a nice little interface, you can see all the information you could ever need about that build. Shareable, everything can be turned into a clickable, shareable URL, pass it off to people. So, so what do we recommend? Pull all that data about the build, right? Wherever you get it from, put it in a single place that's shareable and easy to navigate and self-service for developers, all right? That's how we can help deal with the inefficient troubleshooting. Then, um, avoidable failures. Uh, this is another common metric that's just not really being observed by a lot of organizations, not aggregated in the right way. What failures are being experienced across the organization in terms of build and test failures? How frequent are they? How long does a developer have to wait, on average, to encounter that failure? Knowing that when they troubleshoot it, they're just going to have to spend that time waiting again. All right, so failure analytics. Uh, flaky tests. We'll talk a, a good bit about flaky tests. Um, flaky test analytics, right? What is a flaky test? It's a test that under the exact same conditions can either pass or fail, depending on something. We don't really know. It's flaky. So we want to detect those. We want to stick them on a dashboard. Um, the Gradle build tool team, and also the Gradle enterprise team, they schedule flaky test days as part of their, as part of their work. They have a cadence. They open up the flaky test dashboard, they start at the top, the flakiest tests, and they just fix, 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 fix. Okay? So we'll talk about that a little bit as well. Then finally, last pillar, not really about productivity, but it's worth mentioning. So many of these technologies that you'll see are basically just work avoidance if we look at caching and if we look at predictive test selection. And it stands to reason that if you're replicating a lot of your work in CI or in some metered cloud environment, that those processes will be doing less work also. So you'll save money on your CI costs. Great. Okay. I don't like to focus on that one too much, though. It's not really about productivity. Okay, so very fast feedback cycles are important. How important are they? I think a lot of people don't think about all the cascading impacts that happen when developers are actually experiencing faster feedback cycles in their build and test. First of all, developers tend to build more often. All right? They're asking for feedback more often refining your work more often, right? That leads to smaller change sets, reduced complexity when we're actually trying to, to, to merge, right? So that leads to fewer merge conflicts, which leads to more efficient troubleshooting, faster mean time to resolve, uh, recover, whatever you want to call it, which bubbles back up to quality and certainly productivity, all right? We also know up at the top, uh, less time waiting on build, uh, uh, idle wait time, means less context switching, all right? Less paying the cost of a context switch, trying to uh, divert our attention between two different uh, uh, sort of focuses. A lot of research has come out over the last couple of years that not only can humans not multitask, I mean, some of you may think you can, but it's just your brain sort of tricking you. It's actually deleterious to try. It's actually bad for your executive functioning. It can literally cause brain damage to try to multitask too often. So we want to try to eliminate that possibility by reducing the feedback cycles, which means you get more focused developers who are, again, producing higher quality code, uh, and they're doing so more productively. Let's actually look at some numbers here to sort of put things in perspective. So this slide sort of tells two stories. So let's kind of tell the first one here. First one is that you've got a team of 11 developers, yeah, decent-sized team, and their build times take about four minutes to complete. 
Now, depending on who you are, where you are, what you build, four minutes may sound really, really long, or it may sound really, really short. <laughs> Depends on, on what your code repository looks like. But either way, I want you to compare that figure to the team of six who can build in one minute. The team of six is able to produce over 1,000 local builds in the same period of time that that team of 11 can only produce 850. That team of six is actually able to refine their work, well, what, 25-ish 20, percent more often than the, 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 than the larger team. Okay, so one story, four minutes with 11 uh, is actually not as productive as six with a one minute build time. But the other one too is that if you're the kind of person who thinks, oh, four minutes, that actually sounds great. I would love that. Well, really think about setting your goals even further. What if that four minutes could be one? What if that one minute could be 0.06 for this team of six developers? What if their build time uh, went from one minute to 0.6 minutes? That returns 44 engineering days a year to this small team of six. That's like almost two full vacation cycles. Right? That's, that's valuable time being returned. What about a team of 100 doing uh, 12,000 builds a week? Taking a nine minute build time to five minutes frees up 5,200 days a year of engineering value. So build caching uh, is the first acceleration technology that we mentioned, and that helps us deliver fast uh, build and test feedback cycles. In Java, uh, this technology was introduced to the world by Gradle, the open source Gradle build tool back in 2017. Uh, it's not the only build tool that can, that can use a build cache. Right? We brought, brought Parity to Maven to allow that. Bazel has a build cache. So, uh, definitely recommend that whatever your build, build system is, you look into that possibility first. Can I be doing build caching? Um, what is a build cache? Well, first of all, it's not a dependency cache. Right? So now I've got, we've got our friends from, from JFrog here. This is not artifactory. Right? This is complementary to a dependency cache. Right? A build cache is actually speeding up individual phases of your build. It's taking inputs from the build process, and it is looking at the outputs, usually compiled classes or whatnot, and then storing those outputs against a cryptographic key based on the input. It's very elegant, actually, totally stateless. As long as the inputs to that phase of the build are exactly the same and generate the same cryptographic key, then the output can be stored in a cache, it can be reused by that developer, or even stored in a remote cache so that CI or other developers can help uh, contribute to a cache that's being used by other folks in the organization. And it just helps you skip part of the build process, right? If, uh, if I've made some changes to my source, and I'm in a, a pretty nice modular project, and those source code changes don't impact every class, why do I need to compile the entire thing, right? I, I don't, and a lot of us already take manual steps to try to work around this, to, to try to only do you know, s smaller parts of the build when we're working on smaller parts of the code. But we can automate this, right? We can use caching. Process, again, kind of looks like this. You know, most of the, in this case, Gradle tasks, Maven goal executions, Bazel targets, um, they have a specific set of inputs, right? Lots of stuff, source code files, environment details, the JVM major version, um, properties, and things like that. And they all get put together again, into a giant, uh, you know, not giant, it's pretty small, actually, cryptographic key. And then the outputs are stored in a cache against that key. And then later, when the inputs are ever the same and capable of generating that same key, well, then we just pull that part of the build from the cache as opposed to rerunning that part of the build. Um, build scans can speed up troubleshooting. Uh, again, this is part of the open source, woo, that's a little dangerous. It's part of the uh, open source uh, uh, Gradle build tool, uh, also available for Maven. Uh, and like I mentioned, it's a sort of a shareable build summary, uh, like an MRI or an x-ray, sort of the entire build process. Um, very easy to spot bugs and failures, um, and uh, totally self-service to the developer. The Gradle build scan functionality is also recognized by a lot of different CI solutions. So if you kick a build off to CI and then you look at a build report, 
uh, you'll often, if, it, if it's aware of Gradle build scans, the link to the build scan is sometimes you know, right there for you in the CI. So again, totally self-service to the developer. Some folks just like to run these things when builds fail. You know, they don't like to run them all the time. The more often that you run them, though, this should always be an entry point into your next sort of phase of analytics, right? So these would represent data for one single build, but you're going to pull a lot of metrics into this report, right? You're going to pull the entire build time, the test cycle time. You're probably going to pull a bunch of stuff about the environment, any failures that were encountered, any, any tests that failed, right? A lot of these things you can then push further down into, into more analytics that give you better observability and can let you take uh, more action on that data. But it should all start with having a mechanism for capturing the forensic details of what happened during a build, making that shareable, self-service to a developer, easy to navigate, and then take some of those metrics and, and do more analytics with them. Test distribution. All right, the uh, second acceleration technology uh, kind of next to caching. So most more sophisticated projects these days spend the majority of their time in the test phase. Right? I think that's probably fair for more sophisticated projects. Um, you know, you have projects with multiple tens of thousands of unit tests and browser tests and integration tests and all of these things. So we mentioned caching. We mentioned that caching can you know, help us uh, avoid tasks or goals in Gradle. Those obviously could be test tasks. Those could be parts of the test cycle that we're actually able to uh, cache the output from. We also have a machine learning uh, capability that we'll talk about that helps us reduce that test set even further. But what about the tests that still have to run? Right? I mean, at some point, if you have made changes, it's probably a good idea to run tests against those changes. Not necessarily a good idea to run every single test that might not be related from an impact analysis standpoint to the changes that you made, but you're going to have to run some tests, right? Well, then don't run them serially, right? Come up with a mechanism for distributing those tests, right? Uh, for in our case, we just have small test agents that are capable of uh, bootstrapping JUnit 5 or a platform or JUnit Vintage tests, stick them in a Docker image, and distribute them through Akita, Horizontal Pod, Autoscaler, and Kubernetes. Okay. That is all available to you in terms of elastically scaling architecture that can work just fine with Java and can launch unit tests. Um, and the majority of that is just free and open source and available to you. Right? But some means, then, of distributing that work. And the other thing that I want uh, for, for you to implement when you kind of look at a test distribution solution it should work locally. Right? It shouldn't rely on CI. Right? Whatever's being done here, the test execution should be able to be kicked off from the local environment. Uh, we have a kind of a new campaign that we're working on at Gradle, which is our build local campaign. This came out of some research that we were doing with Atlassian. We were just sort of brainstorming, hey, what, what, what are some qualities, what are some conditions, characteristics of, of a healthy build tool chain or, or an organization that has a healthy build tool chain? And one of the things we kind of agreed on was like, if you can do most of the work locally if you don't have to rely on CI or a remote environment, if your build is actually optimized, that you can get that feedback right there. So build local. For some of you may not be familiar, the, 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 there's a buy local campaign. It talks about the benefits of buying from local stores, right? So build local, it's, it's cute. But uh, anyway, uh, test distribution. Your solution should not rely on CI. You should be able to distribute tests right from the local build environment for the developer. Uh, so, well, actually, we already kind of covered this. Uh, all right, so those were two acceleration technologies. We'll talk about a third one when we get into the ML part of this talk. Um, but let's talk a little bit about observation. Uh, this quote used to be, you know, what gets measured gets improved, but I've seen that in like five billion presentations around DevOps, so I wanted to change it up. Basically means the same thing. You can observe a lot just by watching. Okay? Said again, going back to what we said from the beginning of this, very few people even looking at local build times for developers. Right? Well, so there's no chance of trying to really improve that in any, in any in a quantitative fashion. Right? I mean, you could, you could listen to the developers who are complaining the loudest and follow them. You could try anecdotal advice and see how that improves things. Or you could actually observe and look at data. Right? Because without focus, Problems can break right back into the tool chain. Right? This isn't a one-shot deal 
turn on caching, figure out some distribution, and then things will be fast forever? No. No, things change in the code base all the time, right? Maybe new means of binary management. Uh, maybe some new annotation processor version comes out, and all of a sudden it takes twice as long to, uh, to generate all the code from your annotations. Maybe uh, something changes in your build logic configuration. Maybe some new endpoint security or a return to the office. You know, I mean, all these different variables can change the local developer experience. So it's really, really important that we are observing these things. And so that's where this idea of sort of encouraging continuous improvement, fixing the more chronic, uh, yeah, the more chronic productivity problems of the organization come in. So the first one we'll look at then is flaky test detection. Flaky tests, the infinite pit of sorrow <laughs> for developers. Um, flaky tests are bad in so many different ways. First of all, it adds just to a lot of developer confusion, right? You don't have a reliable tool chain uh, if sometimes, under the same conditions, tests pass and then other times they, they fail. Um, there's a psychology here that most of us have probably been guilty of at least once in our career, and that is, oh, the test failed. I better run it again. Oh, it passed this time. Great. Done. Yeah, that's problematic. That was a bug. That was a bug that you just sort of kicked down the road, but um, not be able to prove that without making the test reliable, right? We should also have no problem detecting a flaky test. If we're already able to look at our inputs to create cache entries, and those inputs are reliable, well, then we should be very easily be able to identify a situation where the same inputs to a test cause non-deterministic outcomes. Oh, pass this time, failed that time, pass this time, failed that time. How often is it flaky? Calculate those things. Put it on a dashboard, right? And then deal with them. If you have this stuff actually detected and you can view it, then you can take action on it. Your teams can schedule flaky test days too. You'd be amazed what that does to your quality and the, uh, the amount of toil uh, that developers no longer have to deal with. So the test and, and failure analytics, they should look really at a couple of things. Flaky tests are, I think, you know, very easy to talk about why we should be eliminating those from the tool chain, uh, how they can introduce quality problems, and also how they can just introduce more toil. But what about just common failures? You know, what about the failures in the build that are ex getting experienced a thousand times a week by 50 different developers, but nobody's complaining about it, right? Or maybe people are complaining about it, but nobody's taking any action, right? Maybe there's just not the data to prove, hey, this is really problematic. Wouldn't it be nice to know if 100 developers in your organization were pretty much every day dealing with a failure that it took 15 minutes for them to show up, and then they, they, they dealt with that failure, and then they, 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 they went on and did something else? It would be really nice to have a clear understanding of which are the most common failures are in an organization are causing the most toil, because then you can deal with them, right? You can deal with that failure, and then you can watch the cascading impact of dealing with that failure. And then trends and insights. So don't just capture the local build times or the test feedback cycle times, the test failure rates. Don't just capture that you know, once right, and call it done. Right? Put it on a dashboard. Capture it over time. Look for outliers. Right? Understand when performance regressions are introduced to the system. Um, we have a, there's a blog floating out there. This is pretty public knowledge. Uh, one of the productivity leads at Netflix, was we were doing an interview with them. We have these uh, kind of these cool events called our Dev Prodeng Lowdown, our Developer Productivity Engineering Lowdown. And this is where we will uh, sort of have a sort of fireside chat kind of interview with somebody who's working on developer productivity in their organization. And so we were interviewing a guy named Danny Thomas from, from Netflix. And we have a, a blog out there that talks about kind of their whole experience. Test distribution was, was great for them. Uh, the solution that they implemented took their Netflix Android app build from 64 minutes down to less than five, which has totally changed the way that that team is able to work on that app. But he said something during that interview that really stuck with me. He said, Justin, it is staggering the amount of toil and friction and frustration that engineers are willing to put up with. <laughs> and it's true, right? Without actually taking a look at whether performance regressions have been introduced, a lot of the times developers are just saying, oh, 
the build's taking five minutes longer than it did before. That sucks. I'm going to go get coffee, you know? So, but by having that actually actionable and on a dashboard, leadership can look at that. Leadership should look at that and say that I can improve this situation for my developers. And then, of course, machine learning will help us lead to uh, even greater efficiencies. Um, we recommend looking into the practice of predictive test selection. This is relatively new. You started seeing uh, uh, some of these algorithms and approaches coming out of the labs, and uh, like Google Labs and stuff like that around 2014, 2015, the very early uh, versions of this. Uh, the, the, there's a famous paper published, an academic paper published by Facebook in 2019 that really cemented this. But what, what is it really? Well, it's a new form of thinking about test impact analysis. So whereas traditional sort of incremental testing or, or traditional test impact analysis will just take a look at, okay, these source codes, uh, this, this source changed, and there's a dependency then on these different modules, and then these different modules have these different tests associated with them, and I just better run that whole suite for this one line little source change that may or may not be related to all of these different tests. Well, that's led a lot of us to start doing manual test selection. I, I know we're guilty, I know we're doing this. Uh, we're, we're, we're saying during our builds, okay, I'm actually just gonna partition this one little test set, I'm just gonna run these tests because I'm pretty sure these are the only ones that are actually impacted by my code change, and I don't have time to wait five hours for my full test cycle to complete. Okay, machine learning can help us with this. Machine learning can look at the history of changes that have been made uh, to the source and to the modules, and they can take a look at historically have those types of changes impacted these types of tests. And it can say, all right, well, you got 20,000 tests in this uh, test suite, but looking at those changes and looking at a history, that really only impacts has ever actually changed the status of maybe five of these tests. And I think five of these tests are likely to fail based on those changes that you just made, so I'm just gonna run those. I'm gonna skip the ones that would be successful. Now, should, it, should this always be in place? No, obviously, post-merge mechanisms should run all tests, but not every time that the developer's making changes, and certainly not locally. Now, uh, we've been able to make this model work pretty well using Facebook's recommendation of a gradient-boosted machine learning model. So we're not using deep learning for this. When we, when we went to implement this, we actually we wanted to see if we could make this work using just multivariate analysis and not even traditional machine learning, but we couldn't get the kind of accuracy we were, we were hoping for. But with the gradient boosted model, we're actually able to get a nice decision tree, high confidence and, and accuracy, and we don't have to have you know, anybody who wants to use the solution install a GPU in their server or something that can power a deep learning network, right? It's, it's not a deep learning model, but it's good enough to get, in many cases, Micronaut is actually using this, the Micronaut project, and they're seeing a 99.9% .9 confidence right now on failed and flaky test detection. Um, part of why we're able to get these types of numbers, though, think back to flaky tests. Think to how a predicted test selection model probably works. Uh, it probably works by uh, taking a look at conditions and taking a look at test outcomes and then training the model based on those outcomes, based on these changes, right? Well, what if I was training my model on a bunch of flaky tests? That's not gonna work, right? Sometimes these conditions cause a, a test to succeed, sometimes it causes it to fail. That's bad data. So we were struggling with our confidence, uh, the confidence of the model. I never struggled with my confidence. We were struggling with the confidence of the model and uh, couldn't get it past the, ac uh, to the accuracy points that we wanted, so we decided to combine things. We combined the flaky test detection that we were already doing filtered those cases out of the model that we were training, and then we started hitting these really high accuracy numbers. So if you go down this path, we'll save you some heartache. Filter flaky tests out of your, out of your training set. It does two things, you're detecting flaky tests and you're doing, uh, you're doing better uh, machine learning, better training. How does it work? Um, pretty straightforward, actually. The whole test set is gonna come in, uh, and the model with a predicted test selection is gonna take a look at the change in uh, test history and just select which tests it actually should run. Right? Then it'll actually run just the ones that were selected by the model, and then return those results to the model, and then retrain. 
right? So when you're building this or looking into this, you have an opportunity to retrain your model every single time a build happens. So don't, don't build in some process for expensive retrains later. Okay, so what did we really see? We saw three acceleration technologies. We saw caching, we saw predictive test selection, and we saw test distribution, right? To kind of recap those things, build caching is gonna help you skip steps in the build that don't need to be repeated because you already have the outputs from those under the same input conditions. So we're gonna avoid some work there. Then predicted test selection is gonna take a look at the test set that wasn't able to be pulled from cache and select out ones that actually matter. And then from whatever is left, whatever work still has to be done, we can distribute that work in parallel. Right? So three acceleration technologies that are available to everyone. Right? With those powers combined, we can start feeling very confident that the build is as fast as it can possibly be given all acceleration, observation, and analytic technologies, and we are doing the right service for our developers. And DPE will become standard practice, right? I, I, we, we talk more and more about this, and we see more and more momentum, more and more people saying, I should be tracking local build times. I can do better with my developer experience. But now is the time. It will become standard practice because the world should foster developer joy. So the best DPE organizations kind of form their own teams. But I, I can't stress enough, all of these teams were formed in the last five years. Now these look like big Silicon Valley companies, and they are. But developer productivity engineering is not just for big Silicon Valley companies. It's for every software company, right? But the recommendation that we make is to create a center of excellence. Instead of making it the part-time job of a developer lead who cares about productivity, spend two hours a week thinking about this stuff, form a developer productivity center of excellence. Google's is over 500 employees strong, just focused on developer productivity, okay? This can change the way that your business operates. If you wanna learn more about this, and I kind of encourage you to, I would kind of ask you, to ask yourself a question, you know, what if you were the person, depending on the DevOps maturity of your business, who insisted on bringing DevOps practices, better DevOps practices into the business five years ago, 10 years ago? What does that do for your career? What does that do for the value that you create for your organization? Well, if you didn't get a chance to be that person with DevOps, good news, you can be that person with developer productivity engineering. There are tons of free information available to you here. Uh, we also have a book, an ebook, on this subject. You see Gradle on the front of it. That's the only time that you'll really see any vendoring within this. This is a very vendorless blueprint for creating strong developer productivity engineering practices within your organization. About 81 pages in its second revision right now, primarily written by Hans Doctor, the inventor of Gradle. Um, and it's a very good read, and we are in the works now with publishers to look at a, a, a third revision and actually physical print copy of this book. Um, but you can... Uh, get a ton of information uh, from here. Uh, we also give our version of, of developer productivity engineering technology, Gradle Enterprise, we give it away for free to a, a bunch of open source projects. I mentioned that Micronaut you know, is, is using our technology and doing really well with predictive test selection. That's one of a bunch of different open source projects. So if you have an open source project that you think would be a really good candidate for this, please let us know. We can get you set up with a license. We can get this uh, hooked up to your project. It's a great way to attract more committers to your project, saying, hey, we've got this great technology that makes it easier for you to be a contributor to our open source project. And that's really it. Thank you. I guess we have, what, five minutes for questions? Is that? We've got a runner down here. We've got Anders helping with the, with the, with the mic. Anybody, don't be shy. All right. Great. Well, thanks again. I really appreciate it.